today's guest has traveled the world offering inspiring and transformational retreats combining psychological and spiritual teachings with lasting and life-changing effects. He's a sought-after spiritual leader, an award-winning author, a TEDx speaker, and leader in the field of breath work. His new book, Awakening the Soul of Power, was described by multiple Grammy Award winner Gloria Estefan as a balm for the soul for anyone searching for the truth and answers to life's difficult questions. Welcome to the show, Christine. How are you doing? Uh, thank you so much for having me on the show, Toby. I'm, I'm happy to be here. And how are you? I'm doing so good. Thank you so much. I'm so excited um, to be speaking with you today. Um, it has been a long time coming already. Like we've um, scheduled this conversation for a long time already. And I've been you know, looking forward to speaking with you. So thank you so much for joining me today on this episode of Mirror Talk. Um, can you just share your life story with me? Like, how did you become a sought after spiritual teacher, transformation, and um, sorry, personal transformation coach and an award winning author? How did you, how did the old journey begin? You know, that's a, 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 an interesting question. I've, I've always had a sense of, of mission, like this desire to make a difference in, in, other, in the world and other people's lives. Mm -hmm. And that has translated itself in, in different ways. Like growing up, I grew up in a very uh, Catholic environment, very Catholic family. I'm one of nine children. Mm -hmm. um, so I used to want to be a priest. And so that was the first part of it. Then... Uh, my dad was a psychiatrist, so I had a degree in, in psychology, and I thought I was going to get a PhD in psychology and, until I discovered breathwork, um, and I never went for the PhD after that because the simple breathing practice that I employ in all my retreats and in my coaching sessions works so fast and heals so profoundly in so many different ways. And I've been offering it now for 30 years all over the world with amazing uh, results. And so now I, it shows itself through, through the retreat work that I do. So I work with groups and it also reveals itself through my private coaching sessions that, you know, that, that are all about personal transformation and per personal empowerment and removing the obstacles that uh, the ways that we have allowed ourselves to be held back from being all of who we are, from, from really stepping into our purpose and, and our power um, and uh, looking at the ways in which we sell out on ourselves and um, you know, give our power away uh, for kind of sad reasons that we do that. We, we you know, for, for an illusion of, of security, for a false sense of acceptance from others and from crumbs for morsels of pseudo love. And so that's why I wrote this book to, to, to let people know that there is a way that we can step into power, into personal power. That is not about hierarchy. That is not about fear. That is not about force, about control. That doesn't require for us to push anybody down, step on them, press our knee to their neck in order for us to prop ourselves up and, and feel powerful. Yes, yes. And in the book, you talk a lot about, you know, um, heroism and also personal power. Um, do you have like a personal, you know, story about this, like your, your life journey in relation to heroism and personal power? Yeah, yeah. There's different aspects to that because I grew up my first 10 years of life in Cuba. So I grew up in a communist regime. And for anybody, you know, of your audience who who has an idea of what it's like to live in a communist, totalitarian, you know, dictatorial mm. um, regime. Um, conversation about personal power is kind of ludicrous. It doesn't make any sense because mm. there is no sense of personal power in such mm. regimes. You know, it's a very power over uh, the, the, the government, the state pretty much owns you and tells you what to do. And so many of the liberties that we take for granted in, in, in democratic countries like you know, the choice of going to college, deciding what we're going to study. Um, a lot of those choices aren't available in, in dictatorial and, and communist regimes. Um, and, and also combine that with the fact that I grew up in such a, a Catholic environment, which is another completely different, but a, another very hierarchical power over structure um, in which you're pretty much told what's, what's right and what's wrong and what to believe and what's not okay to believe. So it's it's... I write that I'm an unlikely person to be writing about personal empowerment and 
uh, what it means to live a heroic life in the 21st century. Yes. Also, because of your, your of your background, so you believe you are not the like the most suitable person to talk about, you know, heroism or personal power, because of your background from Cuba. Yes. Yes. And and um, and, and also, it's an interesting um, aspect of that story is that when we came to the states, um, and I was ten, uh, we lived in in Georgia. So, and I was, the, you know, small rural town in Georgia. Um, and I was the only person who spoke in my class, nobody else spoke Spanish. So I had to learn English. And because of the fact that we had lived in a communist regime and my parents had actually been part of this group of people conspiring against um, the, the, the dictatorial government, um, we grew up kind of with this implicit message of kind of hiding, not, not showing up too much. Mm. Um, so and that was only aggravated or intensified when I came to this country and felt so different, felt uh, like I didn't belong. And so one of the benefits, though, of having grown up in, in Cuba was that we had a TV, but there was nothing worth watching. So I grew up reading uh, and we grew up uh, you know, playing outside and, and inventing our own games and creating our own pastimes. And for that, I'm really grateful because I became a really good student because of I, growing up reading, uh, rather than having my face stuck in a, in, a, in a screen or a telephone or a computer. Yeah. Um, and so, but, but here's an interesting story about that. It's like, I had all A's, you know, which, which is like the highest scores you could get mm. here in, in the States, um, except for one B. Uh, which means, you know, the 80th percentile instead of the 90th percentile mm -hmm. and 90 to 100. Um, and that was enough for me not to get the valedictorian. And, and I didn't do this intentionally. I didn't set out to do this. But looking back on it, I know that I sabotaged my grade point average so that I wouldn't have to give the valedictorian speech. Because at that point in my life, there is no way there's no possible, no human way that I could sit up in front of an auditorium filled with hundreds and hundreds of people mm. and deliver the valedictorian speech. Mm. Um, and and what, so what's interesting about that is that these days, um, you know, I, I speak all over the world. I've spoken at dozens of universities. I've, I've spoken on the TEDx stage. And so the, 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 the importance of that for me or the, or the meaning of that for me is that I know that the, the, the teachings that I share about, uh, about how to transcend our fears, how to overcome the obstacles that we have allowed to hold us back you know, and, and how to free ourselves from our own self-made prison. Mm -hmm. It's like, I know these teachings work from, from personal experience. Yeah. Uh, my, my adolescence was one long depression. Um, I know self-doubt. I know self-hatred, in fact. And these days, like no matter the, the details of my life, like a relationship works out or it doesn't, a project succeeds or it fails, in mm -hmm. quotes, um, no matter the circumstances of my life, I never question my self-worth. Like that is, that is healed, that is established. It's like I know who I am. And so that's part of the, the, the reason I wrote this book is to help other people that are who are um, you know, faced with similar obstacles, which most of us are, you know, most of us, most of us have had to overcome a lot of self-doubt and self-fear and, and, and questioning of ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so the book is, is about helping us step, you know, clear that and overcome that and transcend that and step into our authentic power. Yes. Yes. And, you know, in the book, you, you talk, you talk about, you know, um, how we could live heroically er er and set ourselves free. So to you, what, what does heroism mean? How do you leave that state of you know, self-doubt, self-hatred and become an hero? Yeah, and you know, a lot of that has to, has to do with understanding who we are and why we do the things we do and, and why we sabotage ourselves and why we sabotage our relationships that sometimes it feels like we're in the same boring play or the same boring movie just with a different actor. So why do we do the things we do? And, and why do we get stuck in these patterns of behavior and patterns of relationships? So how do we do it? The first step is self-awareness, right? We can't do anything about something that we don't see. And a lot of, of what drives this kind of behavior is it's subconscious. Um, so 
so the first step is is becoming aware of of the patterns and what our triggers are um, and so the first probably third of the book quarter of the book is designed to, to help us understand the mind the ego mind and and its self-made prison and and its reactive patterns and it's fear-based and it's stuck in victim mode and all its machinations and shenanigans so that we can break free from it you know it's, it's the ego mind it's all about reactivity um and and a lot of the times we think we're reacting or or you know to something that somebody said or did when in reality we're, we're reacting to something that happened in a previous similar situation in our past that we didn't work through that we didn't really that we're still you know traumatized by yeah. and it's still having an impact from the subconscious on, on our behaviors this mm. in, in our relationships today mm. so so we don't really have time in in the podcast to dive deep into the ego mind and, and really understand it like i spend in my weekend retreats we spend hours you know just just diving into that mm. uh but here's a really simple metaphor to help um help people understand what it is if you put a, a baseball or a football um in the center of a stadium that's what the ego is who we are mm -hmm. is actually the stadium and and we've allowed this tiny 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 part of who we are to think that it is all of who we are mm -hmm. and and to make choices like important choices consequential choices about our lives about our relationships from its very small limited an always fear-based perspective. So if we want to be free, if we want to have relationships that have a chance of working, if we want to have a life that is filled with meaning and purpose, if we want to stop giving our power away and settling for less mm -hmm. um, and, and selling out on ourselves, it's really critically important to understand how the ego mind works so that we can break free from its self-made prison. Yes. And before we, we start that, um, the first chapter of your book, you know, starts out with the preparing for the journey, the journey towards um, freedom from all of from self-sabotage, self self-sabotage, for example, or from um, self-doubt or hatred. So can you advise me on how to best prepare for the journey towards heroism and freedom? Yeah, good, good question, Toby. Um, you know, it, to me, it goes back to self-awareness. So, so this journey of, of empowerment, it's really a journey of, of self-love and, and self-worth, a journey of understanding who we really are. And, and like I said before, it, it's got to start with self-awareness. So any, any practices that, that we can come up with in our lives, I mean, first of all, read this book, right? Like understand how the mind works. And, and I've consolidated in, in, in a short section of the book, what takes a lifetime to understand and and i've designed this this book in, in a very interactive way so short chapters with power practices at the end uh, that are designed to help apply the teachings and integrate the teachings into our lives so that it doesn't stay at the level of information like we don't need any more information We're, we've got information overload mm -hmm. what what's what we need what's important is transformation um, and that's the, 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 what those practices are designed to do, to, to again, integrate those teachings into our lives. And, and so understanding you know, what, what the mind is and how it works, understanding the difference between powers, like, like the, the, the thing is that most of us have an ambivalent, a conflicted relationship to power. Like part of us wants it, part of us is afraid of it. And I think at the core, what we fear is that if we really stepped into all of who we are, like if we really owned our power, that other people would be threatened, other people would reject us, and that we might end up alone. Mm. We also fear that we might abuse it, and and no wonder. Like you know, all we got to do is turn on the news or, or glance through the headlines online on any given day, yeah. to witness at least one abuse of power. Yes. And, and what good hearted people, you know, good hearted people don't want to abuse power. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't want to cause harm to our relationships, combined with the fact that we've been conditioned to believe that power is a bad thing. You know, like with, with quotes, like power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And what good hearted person wants to be corrupted? Mm -hmm. uh, what they didn't tell us about that quote, though, is that Lord Acton uh, was speaking specifically 
about political power, not personal power. So combine that with the fact that we've been conditioned to, to be afraid of our emotions. We hate conflict. We avoid confrontation. Somebody along the way decided the emotions were weakness, especially guys, you know, like, like us. We, we, like since we were, we were young, little boys don't cry. That's, that's, you know, like put into our mind to our little young, little impressionable minds. Mm -hmm. And so when you put all that into a mix, and, and, and by the way, the emotions are not strength, they're not weakness, they're not good, they're not bad. The emotions are just neutral. They're energy like everything else. These are energies coursing through our body. They're not good, they're not bad. How we express them, depending on how we express them, they have a good or a negative effect. Mm -hmm. uh, but in and of themselves, they're just neutral. They're just energies. Mm -hmm. And so when you put all that into a mix, what happens is that we end up giving our power away. We end up saying yes, when inside, it really doesn't work for us. In the side, we really mean no. But to avoid conflict because of fear of, of rejection and all the other reasons we've been talking about, we override our, our desires. We override our, 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 our preferences, mm. our beliefs, um, and, and we end up selling out on ourselves and it's not an effective strategy yes and how can we prevent ourselves from selling out our power well in the very ways that we're talking about you know so first of all understanding the patterns mm. like like so mm. becoming self-aware is like the first step mm. so paying attention to our lives rather than just going through life unconsciously right so beginning to understand the nature of power and the book will be very supportive uh, toward that end, like understanding that there's a difference between worldly power or egoic power um, and what I call soulful power or spiritual power or authentic power. So the way that we mostly look at power, we tend to associate power with, pe with people who have money, people who are famous, people who are high up in some kind of hierarchy whether it's a corporate ladder or some kind of religious institution or any other kind of organization. But the thing about all those kinds of powers that because they're outside of us, because they're external to us, mm. they're here today, gone tomorrow. Mm. Whereas the other kind of power that I'm talking about is inside of us, it's internal, it's inherent, innate to each one of us. Nobody can give it to us. Nobody can take it away. We are the only ones who can give it away and we give it away for those lame, sad reasons that we give it away. Um, and, you know, worldly power is, is it's always trying to get something for itself. It always has an agenda. And it's always blowing itself up to, to seem bigger than it is. Mm -hmm. And we don't need a lot of recent examples in terms of, you know, world global leaders to yeah. to see those patterns mm. and, and to also see that you can have all the money and all the power in the world and be miserable and sad and and like i'll stop i'll stop there before before <laughs> getting to getting too much into into the political um arena yeah um and and so whereas the other kind of power that we're talking about you know those the, call it spiritual power i call it soulful power i call it authentic power, whatever you want to call it. It's inside each one of us. And it's rather than being about having an agenda, it's, it's about service. It's, it's rather than being about power over, it's about power with. Mm -hmm. So when we know that we're in our power, when we're in our power, we're not threatened by other people having power. Mm -hmm. Like, like, and, and it doesn't need to prove anything to anybody. And it's humble. You know, so I think of a Gandhi, I think of a Gandalf from Lord of the Rings, you know, in their simple monastic robe, their sandal feet. Mm. You would never know how much power they hold until it's needed. And then watch out, right? Like Gandhi brought the British Empire to its knees when it was at its highest point in terms of global influence mm. without ever landing a punch or shooting a gun. Mm. Like that's power. True. That's true. That's very true. So I would love to um, die back a little to back. Um, I would I'd love to die back a little to um, ego. Um, you, in your book, you have these wonderful maps that you used to describe, you know, different um, things. And for example, in the chapter two, you talked about, you know, the, the empire of ego. And in this, this description or in this chapter, you talked about, you know, um, the zone of power in your book. So can you explain the, the zones of power in the empire of ego? 
Yes, I, you know, again, tried to make the book as, as um, accessible as possible and, and make it fun because it's, it's, you know, it's, it's what we're talking about is really intense. Mm. In fact, this book is part of a series of three. I'm working on the second one right now. Um, and, and the series is titled Calling All Heroes. Like, what does it mean to live a heroic life in the 21st century when, you know, most of us don't have a horse hitched outside and the armors and the demons to slay except the ones in our own heads. Mm. You know, those, those, those inner demons that, 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 that drive us crazy and, mm. and that the voices of self-doubt and fear mm. and et cetera, all, all the stuff we've been talking about. Uh, so in terms of, so I used to, you know, the hero's journey as an example. And so I had this, you know, hired an artist to design, to design these maps of, of this journey of empowering, empowerment. Mm -hmm. So in order to get to the zone of power, you've got to go through different realms. Um, um, and in order to have relationships that work, mm -hmm. um, you know, which is one of, one of the realms in this map or, or, or or the realm of purpose mm. or the kingdom of power or you've with the first step yes. that we've, that we've got to go through is understanding the empire of the ego, mm. because if we want to have relationships that work, if we want to have a life that is filled with meaning and purpose, if we have, if we want to be able to, to step into our power mm. authentically mm there's no way around it as far as I, as far as I can see, right? We've got to first understand how the ego mind works and how it keeps us in that self-made prison of doubt and, and self-hatred and, and, and questioning mm -hmm. of, of ourselves. Yes. So can you explain like for a layman that's out there and asking, Oh, how does this, how does it actually work? How does the ego, um, you know, encage me or put me in a trap? Can you, can you explain this to us? Yeah, um, you know, it's, and it's, again, it's a big conversation to have mm -hmm. in, in a 45 minute, you know, interview. <laughs> yes. uh, but it's, you know, the, the ego mind, like if we think about, you know, the Latin name for humans, you know, homo sapiens sapiens. Mm -hmm. One way that we can translate that is humans who know that we know, right? So the ego is that is what's, what's called a self reflexive consciousness this is that ability to look back upon ourselves um, and as far as we know we're the only species that is able to do that that has a sense of self is that sense of individual personality like this is christian over here that's toby over there it's it's both a leap in consciousness because of that and it's also the source of all our suffering uh, ken wilbur who writes about about this, you know, about this kind of stuff in a, in a profound way, not easy to read, yeah. uh, but very helpful way. It talks about how humanity hasn't, hasn't always had an ego. We haven't always had a sense of self. Uh, you know, there are some species that, that we think are different than, you know, like we, we have some suspicion about the, the dolphins and the whales and the higher primates um, and the elephants. Like, like, you know, like there's a difference between them and say a dog or a cat. Like we've seen the YouTube videos. You put a dog or a cat in front of a mirror and they'll start interacting, uh, you know, playing or attacking that image as if it was another dog or a cat. Mm. They've done studies, for example, where you put a higher primate, a chimp, a gorilla in front of a mirror and they'll put ash on their shoulder. At some point, you know, they'll, they'll rub their shoulder so that they lets us know that they realize that that image is that. Mm -hmm. Like to jump from that to having a sense of self, we can't do that. Mm -hmm. Like we don't know how they think of themselves yes. and probably never will. Uh, so, so having a sense of self is like a leap in evolution and it's a source of all our suffering because Ken Wilber, ta Ken Wilber talks about how up until the time that we developed a sense of self, a sense of individual personality, Humanity felt at one with all of creation, like the rest of the creatures on the planet, like we didn't have a sense of separation. Mm -hmm. And when the ego evolved in us, it's like, again, it was a huge leap in evolution. It's one of the reasons we're so intelligent and so successful. And now, you know, there's a price to pay, right? There, now we can have, in having a sense of individual identity, now we can feel lonely. Mm -hmm. We can feel abandonment. We can have abandonment issues like 
so many of us do. Yeah. We can, we, so one of the reasons m- many of us feel struggle with depression and loneliness, mm-hmm. uh, we can have a sense of our own mortality. Mm-hmm. So the, definitely a price to pay for having an individual personality. Yeah. Yeah. And so, I mean, there's so much to say about that. There, the ego, it, that, like there's a lot of patterns that, that are related to this part of us that, for example, it, it's very reactive. It, it, rather than, that, than choosing how we be, we're, we're always reacting with, to what other people said and do. So, and as long as we're reacting to others, we're giving our power away. Um, so it's very integral to, to this journey of personal empowerment. Uh, the ego is also um, stuck in, in victim, in, in a very victim uh, mindset in relationship to life. Like, like we're always feeling, you know, like poor me, woe is me. If, if only this hadn't happened, if only mom hadn't been this way or daddy had done that, mm-hmm. if, if it hadn't been for the teacher or for the minister or for the rabbi, if, if, if only they hadn't been this way, if only our ex hadn't left us for somebody else, if only the boss hadn't fired us, and or even systemically, like if only the world was different, if only there wasn't sexism or racism, if it wasn't for homophobia, um, then I would be okay. And by the way, not to deny that any of those things exist and not to deny that the system is, is rigged in favor of some or over others. It's, it's not about that. It's, it's about this relationship to life that we have. Because as long as we're holding someone or something outside of us responsible for our state of being, for our happiness, for our success in the world, we're giving our power away. And, and, and this is tough, you know, this is nothing short of heroic because like stuff happens to people yes. and, and, and humans do bad things to each other. So it's not to deny any of that. Yes. It's not to deny anybody's past or anybody's trauma. It's not to minimize any of that. Mm. It's saying, however, that if we want to be free, if we want to be able to step into our power, we've got to come to terms with that. Because one thing that we, we can count on is that life is going to continue throwing curveballs our way. That we know, right? Things that we just didn't see coming and, and difficult, challenging things are going to happen. That we know. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and so rather than being stuck in this passive victim relationship to life, mm-hmm. if we can just do a, a slight reframe, and say, you know what, no matter what happened in the past, no matter, no matter what happens going forward, mm. that we can do nothing about, right? However, we can always choose how we are going to be in response to that. Mm. And, and that alone, that, that slight reframe changes everything. It's a game changer. Yeah. Yeah. And nobody embodies that and exemplifies that better for me than Viktor Frankl, the Austrian psychiatrist who spent years in concentration camps. Like he lost everything. They took everything away from him. Mm-hmm. His, his education, his practice, his property, lost everything, his whole family, his pregnant wife, everybody was taken away from him. And, and so being in a concentration camp, um, this guy would like try to observe and try to figure out and ponder why some people seem to survive mm. and others didn't. Mm. And, and the more that he looked into that, the more that he discovered that it had nothing to do, like it seemed to have nothing to do with education or, or socioeconomic status before that, or, or, or looks or physical strength, uh, had nothing to do with that. You know, like in that sense, it, it seemed to be a great equalizer. Mm. What seemed to make a difference in that setting, the people who seemed to survive were ones who had a sense of meaning, a sense of purpose. Mm-hmm. And, and that's, that's why he wrote a book called Man's Search for Meaning. And that's why it's so important for us to get in touch with that for mm-hmm. ourselves. Like, what are we really here for? What, are, what drives us at a soul level, at a mission level? Mm-hmm. And so he was able to, to say, now that guy was able to say that <clears throat> they could take everything away from him except for one thing. And that was the ability to choose how he would be in response to that. And, and again, not to minimize anybody's trauma or, or, or their pain, of course not. But if that guy was able to say that in a concentration camp, mm-hmm. like we can do it in our lives. 
certainly we can do it in our lives because every little choice point that we take for granted every single day, mm -hmm. you know, like most of us, you know, am I going to get up at seven or am I going to snooze my alarm and get up at 7.30 today? Am I going to have breakfast? Am I going to have oatmeal? Am I going to have eggs for breakfast or maybe just a piece of fruit? Am I going to wear my red shirt or my blue shirt? And those are just the little choices, not to mention the big choices in life. You know, what am I going to study? What am I going to do with my life? How am I going to get into this relationship? Am I going to say yes and go on that date? None of those choices, right? Everything was taken away from him. And he was able to say it there. So certainly we can do that in our lives. Yes. From from the story you just shared now, I, I'm having this like, I'm getting the, like the, the understanding that we have to be very, very, you know, um, conscious of the meaning of our lives. So for someone out there who's asking, oh, how can I find the true meaning to my life? How can I find the true purpose to my life? Is there, are there ways we could do that? Or it just comes to us naturally? You know, it go back, goes back to me, which is going with it. You know, there are very, very few things that, that I'm dogmatic about. And, and that's one of them. And, and I don't really mean dogmatic because if, if somebody can show me a different way, I'm willing to, to entertain that. Mm -hmm. But if we want to be free, if we want to step into our power, if we want to have purpose and, and discover what, our, what the meaning and our purpose for ourselves is, it's like, I don't see a way around that. Like we've got to be able to go with them because all the answers to all our questions lie inside of us, mm -hmm. right? And, and that's hard. Like it's a lot easier to go through life, you know, just kind of coasting and, and you know, going with the flows, ebbs and flows of life and having other people, people tell us what's right and what's wrong and what we should do with our lives. Anybody can do that. But to, to go within, to pause, to ask the hard questions, you know, like the existential questions, like, who am I? Yes. What am I here for? What, what do I like? What are my preferences? What, what, you know, those, nobody really can answer that for ourselves. So the only way we're going to find those answers and all the answers to all our questions is by going within. Mm. And that takes work. That takes courage. It is yes. nothing short of heroic. Mm. And, and it is so worthwhile. Because in our willingness, with having the courage to do that, yes. we we set ourselves free. Yeah. So we have to look within to do work. Yes. 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 And, and talking about doing the work, um, in, in the fourth chapter of your book, you write about the constructing our relationship to power as part of our own work of cultivating our own garden. So what, what are like some you know, um, commonly held fears or misconceptions that we have about power? Oh my God, there's so, there's so many of them. Like, you know, starting with the one we, we were talking about before, power corrupts. Mm -hmm. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. Like so many of us fear that if I really stepped into my power, that we would end up alone, that other people would be threatened by power, that power is bad, that power is evil. Um, and, and women have this whole other layer of it because the, the balance of power in this world has been so off balance for the last you know, several thousand years of, of the patriarchal system. Mm -hmm. So I do retreat specifically, I do retreats for everybody, but there's one retreat that I do specifically for women on women's empowerment. Okay. And, and that stems from my belief that, that the empowerment of women is the single most important thing that needs to happen in our world. And it's not to make women better, it's not to put women up on a pedestal, it's not to, to idealize women, it's not to give women more stuff that they have to clean up and more, more clean up this mess on this planet that, we, that we've created on this planet. It's because the imbalance of power. And, and when I think about like strategically, like what is the one thing that we could do that will then impact everything else. Yeah. That's what I land on. Because when women are in 50% of power, we're going to have a very different relationship to war and poverty and hunger and wealth distribution and how we treat the environment and, and social justice and all of it. And, and again, it's not to, 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 to idealize women. Women are also equally capable of abusing power. So it's not about that. Mm -hmm. It's because of this imbalance of power that we have been living under. Mm -hmm. And so that connects to, to the different types of power. You know, the, the, the worldly power is more, uh, you know, masculine, if you would, it's more male, it's more about power over. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, the, 
the more feminine approach to power is more about power with. Um, and, and let me add to this, you know, that for, for, for the guys listening, uh, that this hierarchical power structure yes. doesn't work for anybody, certainly doesn't work for women, and, and that the abuse of women of the several thousand years and the injustice and the inequity um, is just like, like enough, right? It's no longer acceptable. Mm -hmm. And the system doesn't work for men either. Like, I don't know the numbers globally. Uh, but if, if you look at the, 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 the suicide rate in the United States, men commit suicide four times as frequently as women do. 70% of the suicides in the U.S. are committed by middle-aged white men, which when we look at the world, they still hold the majority of power. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so what's up with that? Let's look at the, at the longevity numbers in the U.S., women outlive men by five years. When we look at the numbers globally, it's seven years. So interesting, right? What, what, what is up with that? And I think part of the reason for that is that we've gotten this twisted misunderstanding of what it means to be a man and, and a very limited perspective of what it means to be a man. And part of that, you know, because what we were talking about earlier about that we've turn the emotions into weakness. Mm. It's like, so men walk around like these robots, you know, these uncaring, unfeeling robots, because we were taught that, that little boys don't cry. Mm. And, and that to feel is a sign of weakness. It's like, and that just isn't so, you know, like we're saying, it's like the emotions are not strength, they're not weakness, they're just energies. Yes. What used to be spiritual teaching, mm. that everything is energy, now we know from physics, from quantum physics, that it's true. Everything is energy. The body is energy, even though it feels solid. Emotions are energy. We know from physics, energy cannot be destroyed. So just because we suppress our emotions, we don't allow ourselves to feel, that doesn't go away. You know, that those emotions, those suppressed emotions get stuck, like it, it, Get, get embedded into our bodies and get stuck in the tissues of our bodies. And what happens after years and decades and a lifetime of doing that is we walk around with layers upon layers upon layers of suppressed emotional crap. And then here we are, like trying to have a, a relationship in the present moment. Yeah. And we think it's just happening in the present moment, but it's all getting filtered through that lifetime of suppressed emotional crap, which we then start dumping on each other's laps. How it boggles my mind that any relationship can work because we haven't been taught how to hold, how to contextualize our relationships. And that's why the second book that I'm writing is about relationships, how to, how to attract and create relationships that can actually work. Mm. And, and so what happens too is that because the emotions are energy, like what, two things can happen, right? We suppress, we suppress, we suppress. And then the next unfortunate one comes and they say or do something the wrong way and boom, we explode inappropriate to that situation and we cause harm to our relationships. Mm -hmm. Or we suppress, we suppress, we suppress. That energy has to come out one way or another. So either it comes out in those reactive, ungraceful ways that cause harm to our relationships or they start seeping out they start coming out and, and showing up in physical symptoms, mm -hmm. cancer, heart attacks, stomach ulcers. So, so that's why we've got to get this. We've got to heal our relationship to our emotions. And we've got to figure out a way to have our emotions rather than be had by them, right? So that bring choice yes. back into the equation so that we are not being driven by our subconscious emotions yes. and our unhealed traumas. Yes. And that's the heroic journey. That's what this whole, um, you know, series and, and this journey, this book about empowerment is a heroic journey. Yes. So can you give us like a little insight into the, the second book that you're working on right now? Like, um, how can we make our relationship work? And sometimes why do we find ourselves in relationship that are self-defeating or, you know, um, self-destructive or something? Yeah. And, and I mean, that's another huge conversation. That's what the whole second book is about. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, so much of it is, is driven by subconscious patterns. Mm -hmm. Like, like if we have any remnants, which we all do, right? we all came out of this, we have any remnants of self doubt, of, of, of 
self-worth issues. Like if, if we have these subconscious beliefs that, that there's something wrong with me or that, or, or, or that I'm not good enough or that I'm too much of this, not enough of that, right? Which, which we all grew up with, which by the way, they're all misunderstandings of something that we misheard or something that, are, that our parents probably, you, you know, because all, most of it goes back to our relationship to our parents, but in a moment of reactivity, in a moment of overwhelm, they just, or, or because they weren't taught how to parent by their parents before them and their parents before that. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, so, so at some point we heard something or we were told something and we took it on, or maybe we, maybe our parents got divorced, right? And, and rather than like from our limited young minds with our limited perspective of those young minds that didn't know any better, we made a conclusion. We made it about ourselves. We took it on. It's like, how could daddy leave me? You know, how could daddy leave us? Doesn't dad love me? And then the deeper meaning of that. What, what does it say about somebody whose dad doesn't love them or whose dad leaves them or mom, you know, whoever left? Mm-hmm. Uh, so what's wrong with us, right? That's how we land at those misunderstandings about ourselves because it's not true mm-hmm. that, you know, that, that, that we're damaged, that there's something wrong with us. Mm-hmm. I, you know, they're, there's, they're just misunderstandings from young minds that didn't know any better. But if we've got that stuff going on, and of course, that's intense, especially for a young mind. It's intense for anybody, but especially for a young mind to deal with. Mm-hmm. So we suppress all that stuff and, 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 and we don't deal with it consciously. But again, we can't sweep it under the rug. That stuff doesn't go away. Mm-hmm. So it begins to drive us and it continues to impact or the quality of our lives and the kind of relationships that we have. Mm-hmm. And so we've got any of that going on, right? Like I'm not good enough if there's something wrong with me. Yeah. That's all we're gonna do. We're gonna attract somebody that's gonna meet us at that level. And, and like, no wonder, no wonder our relationships don't work. And no wonder that, that we keep attracting people who are not a match, yeah. right? Because if we don't respect ourselves, if we don't have a strong sense of self, mm-hmm. that's all we're gonna attract. And, and so then, it, and, and also, if, we, if we've got beliefs, like subconscious beliefs mm-hmm. about relationships, you know, like, for example, um, you know, relationships don't work. All relationships end up in divorce. Um, if I get into a relationship, I'm going to lose myself again. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm going to get ch- cheated on. I'm going to be left. I'm going to be abandoned. If we've got any of that going on, which most of us do, then who in the right mind would want to get into this relationship? But we end up having this ambivalence. Like, you know, part of us is like, here, come here. And, and the other part of us is like, no, get away. So we end up doing this, this strange sense of come here, but get away from us. Yeah. And, and we end up sabotaging our relationships from the get go mm. before we even get started by attracting the wrong people, by, by falling for people who are not available who are not a match and, and they either live on the up, other side of the world or, or the other side of the country, or they're already with somebody else, or they're just not there. Mm. And so, and this is all subconscious, by the way, nobody in their right mind would set out to do this. Yeah. But what happens is that we end up sabotaging our relationships mm. and ensuring that they don't work by attracting the wrong people. But the sad part about it, it's not a good strategy because we end up ensuring the very same thing that we're trying to avoid, which is ending up alone. Sure. So it's, it's, you know, it's a sad state of affairs. <laughs> and yeah. there's a way out, right? There's a way out of these patterns. And it all, like we started talking, you know, like, we, like we've been talking about, it all comes from self-awareness. And, and from self-awareness makes possible self-acceptance. Yes. And self-acceptance makes possible self-love. Mm. Mm. That's true. And I, I believe these are also like some of the um, paths to soulful power, right? Or can you walk me through the, the paths to soulful power? Because you, you end your book um, in chapter five, you talk about you know, all the paths to soulful power. Can you like maybe talk more about them? Because you, you, you've already talked about self-love and, you know, um, self-worthiness. I there like some other um, paths that we could um, go on in order to ens- and get soulful power. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot. There's a different paths, which, you know, which is one of those little maps that, that you liked in the book, yeah. um, you know, which is, the, which they're little trails or paths that go from the realm of the ego to, to the uh, realm of power, to the kingdom of power. Mm. Um, and so, for example, one of them is, is the path of forgiveness mm. or the, the path of vulnerability, because we, you know, feel like, let's take, let's look at that one for a moment. You know, the ego 
uh, the ego mind has this confused understanding that you know that we have to walk around like this like like robots like like layers and layers of armors of protection yeah. Yeah. um and you know but if you think about it when we're like walking around like this like all tight and with arms like protecting ourselves and just waiting for the next shoe to drop hmm. and in defcon one you're just waiting like anticipating the next attack sometimes sneaking in the first punch just in case hmm. So like I mean we're like we're walking around like this like that's not freedom that's not power that's prison True. that's that part of that self-made prison mm. um, it's like my God what a way to live uh, in like in a state of constant stress and awareness and just like anticipating the next blow um, whereas if we think about it like loosening our arms and like opening up in relationship to life mm. at first feels scary right? It's, it's vulnerable. But it really, when we think about it, what it implies is, is a much deeper sense of power. Mm. Because when we walk around like this open armed, and not stupidly, of course, like not, that, not stupidly, not opening our heart and, and revealing our, our deepest core to, to anybody who hasn't earned it, or, 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 or like, you know, continuing to trust people who have already shown to us that they're not trustworthy. Mm -hmm. It's not that, you know, but, but it's, it's about our basic relationship to life, which is one of, of trust. And, 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 and what's, what's powerful about that is that it's saying like at the core, what, what it's saying is like, like life, come and get me. Mm -hmm. Like, like I've got this, mm -hmm. like, no matter what you throw our way, what you throw my way, yeah. I got this. It's like, I don't know the details. I don't know what curveball you're going to throw my way next, mm -hmm. but I know that somehow I'm going to be able to handle it. Somehow I'm going to come out on top and I'm going to land on my feet. Yes. And, and that's a very empowered and trusting way to live. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes, yes. That's awesome. That's really great. And once we can, you know, go on this path to soulful and power, we get liberated from every, um, you know, baggages that we've been carrying from our past or any um, self doubt that we might be having from the past or yeah, them self sabotaging that we might be, you know, going through ourselves. Yeah, yeah. That's really good. So, um, you know, majorly you you focused on you know this female empowerment or you know like if the your book talks about, you know, messages for, for, to the female particularly. So what does, what does um, a healthy male power look like? Is it that when we, you know, let's go of that vulnerability and let's say, I say, okay, we're allowed to cry, we're allowed to, you know, express our feelings. Is that what you describe as an um, as a healthy masculine um, power? Yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah. I, thank you for asking that. Yeah, so I added a chapter specifically for men, I'd mm. like to, to, to re-envision like, like, like what it means to be a man in the 21st century to like upgrade. We need an upgrade. We need to update um, our, this program that we have about masculinity and what it means to be a man. Mm -hmm. and, and so, for example, part of what I did in, in that book is talk about the provider. You know, that's one of those roles that men have been so identified with throughout history, right? You know, the man provides for the family. Mm -hmm. and, and what's happening is that as women are stepping into their power, and again, I don't have the numbers for, for worldwide, but in the US, like, I think with, to within the last three, four years, or, or maybe it's longer, it's in the book, the exact dates, but, but there are more college graduates now, more than half of college graduates are women. Which means that women are, are going to become, it's going to start making more money. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the numbers, something like we're approaching 30% of, of the country in, of heterosexual uh, households in, in which women are already making more than, than men, mm -hmm. which is one of the reasons why so many men are like struggling. You know, and so many men are, are struggling with, with that question. And, and at the same time that you combine that with uh, you know, so many jobs being outsourced to different countries and so many jobs that men have traditionally performed are now being replaced by computers and by, by machines. And, and so no wonder that so many men are struggling with who they are. And like there, that, there are so many people, not only in this country, but in the whole world that, that are looking back, like they want to go back to the way things were, which it's impossible. Like, right, that cat's out of the bag. There's no way that, that we're going to turn time back. So, but, so what this chapter talks about is like, right, how do we redefine it? And if, if you're not going to 
be the, the main breadwinner is like, no big deal. Like, what's the big deal, right? Is that is that what it means to be a man, really? Mm-hmm. Like your paycheck, that's the size of your paycheck. It's like, come on. Like that is such a limited view of what it means to be a man. Mm-hmm. So, and so let's, re, let's think about this. Let's re-envision what the provider role is like. You don't have to give up that role. So what about, there is still so much that you can provide, mm-hmm. right? What about providing a safe, empowering psychological and emotional space in which your spouse and your family can grow and develop and thrive like mm-hmm. wow talk about that mm-hmm. and and live into their full potential mm-hmm. wow that is so much bigger and so much better than providing a paycheck uh, what about providing stability becoming a rock in your family structure like that is priceless Right. With that, and from that place, what about sharing wisdom, sharing strengths that can only come from self-knowledge and, and from the willingness to do the work of self-healing, So, which, which also connects to, to the explorer, right? another role that, that, that men have always played. You know, but there aren't that many more places to explore and discover in the world unless you go deep into deep, deep, deep you know, ocean or out into outer space. And most of us are not going to be able to do that. But what about exploring the vast universe inside each one of us? Nobody else can do that. Do that because the, the, the prize, the reward of that journey is, is self-knowledge, self-worth, self-love, like knowing who you are. Nobody can give that to you. And that is priceless. That's true. That's very true. So there are a lot of questions and things I would love to ask from the book, but because of our time, I would just encourage everyone who is listening to get the copy of the book. I'll put the link in the show notes for this episode. There's um, soulfulpower.com. Um, Christian's websites where you could also visit and read more about the book and order the book for yourself. Um, as, a, as a last question, I would love to know um, I, for some people out there, or for myself actually, who is like on a journey of empowerment, are there like some practices or steps that you recommend us to take in order to, you know, enhance or to help our journey? Yeah, um, yeah, Toby, great question. Um, you know, anything that's going to deepen your self awareness, like, like, like for me, like I've learned this along the way. This is not stuff for that that I read in a book or, or learned in a, in a weekend. Like I've learned this for myself. Like, like if you would have asked me 30 years ago what I was feeling, I couldn't tell you because I had no idea what I was feeling. I was emotionally clueless mm-hmm. and, and numbed out. And so, and this is before, you know, um, cell phones, before we all got to walk around with a little computer in our hands and our pockets and our purse books. Mm-hmm. And so... I got a a grid of emotions, like, right. I got a, like a list of emotions and then I created a grid, you know, between like, like a weekly, daily, weekly grid. And I would have a timer, you know, like, because again, we didn't have them built into our computers. So I had a timer, um, from Radio Shack and, and on the hour, the timer would go off and then I'd pause just a minute, 30 seconds. Right. And I would ask myself, OK, what am I feeling? And I would go over my lid, my grid. Say, am I feeling this? Uh, uh-uh. Am I feeling this? Uh, uh-uh. I don't think so. Am I feeling that? Yep, maybe. And, and so after doing that for a few weeks, I became like much more aware uh, of my emotions. You know, I like increase my emotional intelligence, mm. um, which which, by the way, you know, it's like one of the ways that that they're studying now makes us much better leaders and much that leads to much more effectiveness in, in and success in the workplace and in the world mm. um, and and so that you know just a little practice and and it all comes to comes but down to self-observation nobody can tell us what we're feeling nobody can tell us what what our desires are what our dreams are what our strength what our gifts are what are what areas in us need more development and, and focus and practice mm. only we can do that you know, what are, what our triggers are, what our patterns are, yeah. what only we can figure that out for ourselves. And that's why that journey of self-exploration. Yeah, it's hard. Yes, it takes work, but it's priceless. The rewards are infinite. Yes, yes. Thank you so much, Kristen. So what's the best way to connect and to work with you in case there's this one out there who really want to get more information, learn more things from you? What's the best way to connect with you and work with you? Yeah, thank you so much, Toby. Thanks for that question. And thanks so much for, for having me on the show. And thanks for having the show, because I know that you're reaching a lot of people and making a difference in many lives. So thank you for that. Thank you. Uh, in terms of how to reach me, probably, you know, the book is available wherever books are sold. So you can get it on Amazon, you can get it at your local bookstore. 
it'll just take a little bit longer to order it if you want to support your local bookstore. Mm -hmm. uh, and in terms of reaching me, probably the website that you were talking about earlier, uh, soulfulpower.com. Uh, from there, they can access my, my social media. And for your, your listeners and your viewers, for your audience, if they will go to my website now and get on my email list, uh, which we all know how easy it is to just unsubscribe. Uh, so you can do that at any moment. But once they get on my email list, they, can, they will get a sample chapter from the book talking about what it means to live heroically in the 21st century. They'll get some of these power practices that, we're, that we were talking about that are designed to integrate those teachings into our lives. And they'll get a, a recorded, a, a, a short teaching on a guided meditation about trust, mm -hmm. uh, which I find you know, very supportive in, in these times of chaos and, and uncertainty. Thank you so much. I really appreciate this. I would recommend, really recommend everyone to get a book. I have um, a PDF version of it myself. And yeah, I'm still going to have to read it again and again to get more insight and get more wisdom. Thank you so much, Christian. I really appreciate everything you've taught me today. I really appreciate I, I'm, I'm so grateful. Thank you. Thank you.